Welcome to the Meg Quigley Summer Series, offering eight free weekly sessions throughout the summer that will feature a variety of special topics relevant to our mission. A continuation of MQVC's commitment to inclusivity, audience engagement, and community involvement in the arts, the Summer Series will serve students, avocational players, and professionals alike. I am Kristen Wolf Jensen, founder and director of the Meg Quigley Vivaldi Competition. And along with my colleagues on our, our all volunteer team, we invite you to support our mission, including providing prize money by becoming a friend of MQVC at mqvc.org slash donate. Today's session, the third in our series, is titled The Imperative of Community Engagement for Musicians. We hope this conversation will serve to amplify and exemplify the possibilities of how we as artists can make the world a better place in the 21st century. Many thanks to Lee Munoz at Go Bassoon for sponsoring our session today. It's now my pleasure to introduce our host for this panel, Stacy Spring. Thank you, Kristen. Welcome to everyone. I'm honored to be hosting this panel on behalf of the MQVC team and excited for all of you to hear these wonderful panelists. One of the unique elements of the Meg Quigley Vivaldi competition is that there is an audience engagement requirement during the competition in order to encourage contestants to develop this necessary skill. We also realize that beyond the traditional concert hall, it is increasingly important to find creative ways to engage new and diverse audiences as well as to use our art form as a means of creating intentional and meaningful change in our communities. I hope today's discussion will inspire you to explore the numerous opportunities that exist and that you might create to engage audiences and communities inside and beyond the concert hall. I'd like to thank Dave Wells and Jessica Finley Yang for helping out behind the scenes today. We encourage you to use the Q&A and we will try to answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started. Uh, I am Stacy Spring, and I teach bassoon at the University of Tennessee Chattanooga, Lee University, Chattanooga State, and the Tennessee Governor's School for the Arts. I'm also a teaching artist for the UTC Wolf Trap Affiliate Program. So I'd like to start by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves and speak a little bit about their career journey and some of their um, examples of works and projects. So how about we start with uh, Nancy? Great, thank you, Stacy, And um, thank you to uh, Mick Wigley for the, having me here today. Um, right, so my name is Nancy Belmont. I am a freelance musician living in New York City. So I play on and off with a bunch of different ensembles. Um, I'm bassoonist in the City of Tomorrow Woodwind Quintet. Um, and I do a lot of chamber music and contemporary music uh, around the city and elsewhere. I've been a teaching artist for Carnegie Hall and a few other institutions uh, like the South Orange Performing Arts Center in New Jersey, as well as the Bridge Arts Ensemble. And I'm on faculty with, as bassoon and chamber music instructor at a K-12 arts uh, school in Manhattan called the Special Music School as well as in the collegiate level at uh, the Laundry School of Musical Bard College in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, Laundry is an uh, example of right off the bat one of those programs that is they just started doing a, a master's degree there called the Catalyst Curriculum, which is a school uh, that's actively trying to engage their graduate students in taking part in uh, community engagement and audience engagement work, which I think is pretty awesome. Um, I am originally from Spring Hill, Florida. It's north of Tampa. And I did my undergraduate degree at uh, Florida State University, where I studied with Jeff Kiesecker. Um, about 10, yeah, <laughs> Stacey. Um, about 10 years ago, I moved to New York City to do my master's degree at Manhattan School of Music, where like many of these lovely people here today, I studied with Frank Morelli. Um, and uh, directly after that, which uh, is pretty relevant to today's conversation and was a really pivotal part of my career, uh, directly after that, I began doing a two-year fellowship program um, that at the time was called Ensemble ACJW. It's now been renamed Ensemble Connect. But for those of you who don't know what it, that is, it is a um, two-year fellowship program through uh, Carnegie Hall, the Juilliard School, and the Wild Music Institute uh, that's meant to be a chamber music 
uh, program as well as then something that trains the fellows in teaching artistry, community engagement, and um, audience engagement. Um, some examples of things in that program that have become just a pretty regular part of the things that I do. Um, every fellow in that program was paired for two years in a um, New York City public school as a teaching artist for an in-depth residency there. Um, and the things that you did there were a combination of like practical instrumental help, although most of the public schools I've walked into in New York City don't have any bassoonists at them and that's a whole other thing related to budgets and inequality in music in our system of music schools but uh, that's a different story but uh, besides that we did creative projects like uh, composition projects and interactive performances now interactive performances was a part of both our school uh, system as well as the community engagement that we did so we did these concerts at schools all around the five boroughs as well as healthcare centers and hospitals and for incarcerated populations um, after that program, um, I got a lot of experience doing those types of things and it was work that really resonated with me. Um, and so I basically after that jumped into uh, freelancing pretty much full time in the city as well as doing uh, teaching artist work while simultaneously starting my doctorate at Stony Brook, which made it take a really long time to do, but I'm finally done with that. Um, and so I've continued to work on and off in schools and with various ensembles as a teaching artist. Um, outside of my work in schools, uh, I played, like I said, I play with the City of Tomorrow, um, and that's one of the groups where that I'm in and involved with that we're actively trying to think about promoting artistic citizenship through, you know, just our mission statement and what we do, uh, in addition to performing exclusively contemporary music and trying to be really mindful of the composers that we're commissioning and programming. Um, over the past several years, we've had a special focus in our programming on um, climate change and it's the human involvement with our natural world. Um, you know, examples of that, you know, we performed on series that uh, were based on the idea of like water justice, which is the idea that having access to clean and safe drinking water is a human right, um, as well as commissions work, works based on climate change. Great, thank you so much. Um, Kika, why don't you go next? Sure. Hi, uh, my name is Francisca del Carmen Wright, uh, and I go by Kika. Uh, I was born in Tegucigalpa, Honduras, and my like people are from Camayguela, Honduras, which is just like down the street. Uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and I went to Penn State University for a degree in music performance. And then I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison for a master's and then I did two diplomas. And then in like 2015, I moved to Baltimore City uh, to be with my now spouse, Adrian Benton. He's uh, doing a, a degree in not music. And um, I don't know if people know a lot about like Baltimore. Baltimore is 45 minutes from Washington, D.C., and also Baltimore has a dearth of playing opportunities because there's a ton of really extraordinary wind players who live in the area because of all the military bands, and Baltimore doesn't have a strong tax base. It's kind of like uh, a poor city, and a lot of times, I'm sure everybody has figured out by now, if there's not a lot of taxes, there's like not a lot of money going into the city, there's not a lot of arts. So, um, I was like, what am I going to do? I don't know what to do. Um, my good friend, Amanda Collins Escalante, uh, is a horn professor. Now she teaches at University of Missouri, but she, <laughs> cool. she, um, she was teaching at Duke Ellington School of the Arts, and she was like, they're looking for a bassoon and oboe professor. And I was like, well, I sort of know how to play the oboe. I'm going to get my oboe going. And my advice if people want to move to a place like Baltimore and play bassoon, learn how to play the oboe. It will help you and it will also help the people you're trying to help. Anyway, so I taught for two years at Duke Ellington School of the Arts, which is a majority um, black student population. And I taught one semester at Morgan State University in Baltimore, which is a historically black college. And all those kids are awesome. So in 2018, Adrian finished his degree and we moved to New York City. And so 
here in New York is trying to look for similar work because I didn't realize, you know, having these two uh, performance degrees and two um, performance diplomas, I never thought I was going to go into teaching and I can't believe like what I would have missed if I hadn't given it a try. And so now currently I work for, well, pre like coronavirus, <laughs> I was teaching in two schools in the Bronx, uh, MS 244, which is a middle school and Celia Cruz Bronx High School of Music. And um, Celia Cruz, for some reason, actually I know the reason they have the band director at Celia Cruz is like extraordinary advocate for her students, but they have like six or eight like Fox 240s for the kids to play. And they're all like in really good shape. It's who knew, who knew why? So um, yeah, I will say like, uh, as far as like, you know, community engagement stuff, when I lived in Baltimore, I played with a group that was always trying to figure out and kind of failing at how to do community engagement. And I had an idea that um, we should do a survey of everyone in West Baltimore, as many people as we could in West Baltimore, um, and just ask them what would be a good time to have a concert. Like a lot of people who are working class, like they can't go to a concert at Friday at eight or Sunday at three because they're working. So like if we did a concert Friday at noon, could you go to a concert then? And like through, you know, like collaboration and like money constraints and like not having me personally, like not knowing how to like conduct a broad study. Uh, it turned into like playing some concerts in West Baltimore with the Woodwind Quintet. And we played a concert at the Mondawmin Mall, which is a site of the Baltimore uprising. Also, like, I think to put into context, I moved to Baltimore um, in like July of 2015 and Freddie Gray was killed by police in April of 2015. So like Baltimore was like popping, you know what I mean? Like everybody, like everybody's like, so like political awareness was really heightened. And so I have always tried to like keep my consciousness raising, but I definitely like before living in Baltimore, which is like a majority black city, I had no idea like how unfair <laughs> the world can be even like going through the world as a brown woman like I didn't even totally realize until I moved to Baltimore and then working with kids in DC and working with kids in the Bronx like talking to people and just trying to understand how they live their life I'm like wow this is all unfair and so I guess like I'm trying to help people have a more fair music experience and hopefully also like a more fair life and that is my story. Thank you, Kika. You bring up a lot of great issues, and I hope we'll have some more time to kind of dig into some of that. Um, but let's hear from Macaulia next. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you to, uh, of course, to the Meg Quigley of all the competition for inviting me, and specifically to Kristen Jensen, who I am of the lineage of KWJ. She was, uh, I got my undergraduate from the University of Texas studying with Kristen, and I uh, really credit her with, um, you know, giving me a lot of the space in the room to kind of just kind of learn as a student. Um, and so I you know, want to make sure that I, that I thank her personally, as well as Dr. Frank Morelli, um, who was my uh, my teacher as long along with the others here. Um, you know, uh, Frank was my, uh, he, he opened my mind up to just all of these different ways of thinking about artistry and thinking about being a musician. Um, and so between the two of them, I think that they were two uh, really great influences, not only on me as a musician, but, um, or me as a bassoonist, but also on me as uh, just a citizen uh, and a citizen of, uh, of music. Uh, so I want to make sure that I <clears throat> begin by thanking the two of them. Um, so I'm originally from Dallas, Texas, born and raised there. Um, uh, you know, I was a kid who, I wasn't a kid who like heard bassoon at an orchestra and thought that, ooh, I really want to do that. I was really just a kid who wanted to be in band because my older sister was in band. She played clarinet and I wanted to play the saxophone or play percussion. Um, and uh, my band director was like, well, you know, I was in, an, in a disinvested community and so we didn't have enough of those things. And my band director said, we got one of these. And I said, well, what the heck is that? And he said, it's a bassoon. And I was like, okay, I guess I'll play the bassoon. 
Uh, and so that was really the thing that brought me to the bassoon. Um, fast forward uh, several years, um, uh, I was not, I was, a, I was an okay bassoonist. I never made Allstate in Texas. Anyone from Texas knows it's really hard to make Allstate in Texas, although I'm sure there's a bunch of Allstaters from Texas here on the, uh, on the line. Um, and so I was just someone who was, you know, interested in it. I played well enough to do well enough, but not so well, and to get plugged into that particular system of, um, uh, of you know, all state orchestra, youth orchestras, and things like that. Those are things I didn't do growing up. I was really just in the Texas band programs. Uh, then when I went to the University of Texas, I was originally a chemical engineering major. Um, and I switched to music when, uh, while I was there. I loved chemical engineering and it wasn't that it was difficult or anything like that. It was really more just, I really missed playing the bassoon. And so I was like, maybe I should major in band, basically. Uh, <laughs> maybe I should do that. Band is fun. Um, and then I realized that majoring in bassoon was not majoring in band. <laughs> Uh, there was a lot more to it, but I did, uh, I was fortunate to have had uh, some really good mentors, uh, in addition to Kristen, also Ronald Crutcher, who was the uh, the head of the School of Music there at the time, um, who's a cellist, a uh, black man and a cellist, uh, was also a great mentor uh, to me when I was there. Uh, then, of course, as I mentioned before, I went to, uh, well, I got really serious about bassoon when I got into Round Top. I went to the Round Top Festival, um, maybe my third year, fourth year, something like that at UT. And that was when I was like one of these big international festivals. You hear all these great players and you're like, wow, these people are amazing. And I'm here. So maybe I can play too. So maybe I should really get more serious. And Kristen had some really great conversations with me during that period of time uh, to get more serious about playing the bassoon and kind of maximize my potential in that space, uh, which led me, of course, to then moving to um, uh, to New York, where I studied with Frank um, at the Manhattan School. And uh, after I finished my studies in the orchestral performance program there, I was offered a job uh, to audition for a job in uh, the Shanghai Broadcasting Orchestra. And I won that job. Uh, but at the same time, my mother got really sick back in Dallas. And so I moved back home. I, I didn't take that job. And I moved back home to Dallas to be closer to my mother. And while I was there, I took an audition for the Houston Grand Opera. And I was offered a position there. And right at the same, a few months later, after being offered that position, I also got, because uh, I was at that point just applying for everything, I put my hat in the ring to be bassoon professor at the University of Missouri. Uh, that, and that was my first job, actually. I, I took the, rather than taking the orchestral job, I took the college job because I really wanted to teach. That was the thing I wanted to do. And on the bassoon side, what I really wanted to do was to understand how to win auditions so I could teach people to do that. Um, and having done that, I was like, oh, well, I guess maybe I can just go right into teaching now. Here is a 26-year-old kid in this tenure track position. Uh, so I was there for a couple of years, and then I got a position teaching at the University of uh, Memphis, um, you know, right in my late 20s. Um, and that was a really important moment for me, I think, to, uh, to Kika's comment. Uh, it was a city that was 60% Black, or that is 60% Black. And so I always wanted to have some kind of an impact on communities. That was something that mattered to me. And so going from a small college town of you know, tens of thousands of people to going to a place that had uh, upwards of a million people in the greater Memphis area. Uh, and knowing that that group was also 60% uh, black. Um, and it really had like this uh, weird apartheid type uh, dynamic there where you have this, um, uh, you have a, uh, an oppressed, disinvested black majority. Uh, <laughs> that was actually something that uh, was really interesting to me uh, as I was trying to grow even in myself. Um, and while I was at uh, University of Memphis, the first thing that I really wanted to do was to look at my own instrument and think about how could I um, champion music by black composers. Um, and that was my tenure project was to record this CD of music by black composers which don't get me into that conversation uh, <laughs> because it came out in 2000 and what, seven, eight, something like that. And people are now just out and realizing that black people exist. And so people are super interested in that scene recently, uh, even though it's been out for, for well over a decade. Um, and uh, after I got tenure, I was trying to figure out what to do with myself. Like, what do you do when you're 33, 32, 33 years old and you're a tenured professor? Like, what do you do after that uh, when you have a job for life? Uh, and so then I started to turn my gaze quite a bit into uh, doing community-based work. Uh, 
Um, and that really led me down uh, a really, some really great paths. Uh, along with my wife, we, we actually started a chamber ensemble uh, called the Prism Ensemble. And that ensemble ended up becoming a chamber music festival. So we then were like, well, we should let's, let's have a chamber music festival. So we had in the Prism Chamber Music Festival where we had students coming from, uh, from within the city of Memphis, but we realized that we weren't reaching students in these underserved brown communities. So then we're like, well, how do you do that? oh, well, maybe we can create a school program in communities of color, uh, and then we'll scholarship students who've worked with us in that program to then come to our summer program. Uh, so then we started our, we went from our festival to our PRISM in the schools program, and then we built that, and we're like, you know, what we really want to do is we want to have more music in this city that has, uh, is predominantly black. We want to start bringing more black musicians into the city, and we started a chamber orchestra called the PRISM Chamber Orchestra, and then fast forward, and we wake up one day, and we're like, oh, we actually have an organization, and we got to act like we have one, because <laughs> we had a, um, a summer program, a school program, we had a concert <laughs> series, uh, and we had a chamber orchestra. Orchestra. And so we're like, we should really think about this thing as, as an organization. Um, uh, fast forward a few years in that work, I was, I got, I was actually looking for money from a foundation. Uh, and that foundation, um, I was talking to them for like five minutes. And I was, you know, asking for a pretty significant six figure gift. And within five minutes of the conversation, they were like, yeah, 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 no, no, we're totally, we're totally going to give you that gift. No, no problems there. Uh, we want to talk to you about bringing you on as a consultant to help us create a school program. And I was like kind of floored that they were about to give me a hundred thousand dollars. And so I was like trying to process that they were going to give me this gift and that this is that they were also wanted me to come on as a consultant. So I went home and Googled what do consultants do? Um, <laughs> so I could figure out what that was uh, so that I could then do this work with what ended up being called the Memphis Music Initiative. Uh, they, uh, and that one, please definitely put that one in the chat because they do amazing work. Um, and initially they said, we'd like for you to help us to write this program. So I wrote a program, a program design and how to partner with schools. And they were like, this is really cool. Um, can you help us to pilot this program? And I had just gotten this grant from the Sphinx organization to do this big uh, world tour of chamber music and solo recitals and things like that. And I was like, well, not really, I'll need some help to do the administrative pieces. They hire someone to help me do the administrative work. I help with the pilot, it's great. They do this amazing work with teaching artists in that program. Um, and I was you know, fortunate to be on the team that wrote that program. And while I was in the middle of the pilot, they said, hey, would you consider taking a sabbatical next year to help us launch this program? And so I was like, sure. So I take the sabbatical, launch the program. At the end of that, they were like, hey, we know you need to go back to the university, but if we build a whole team for you, can you stay on board and help us do it, still lead the program? You're not doing the administrative pieces, you're really just leading the strategy of this work. And I was like, sure. And then when I got back to doing the work in school uh, at the university, I started thinking about the impact that I wanted to have in this field of music. And so I looked at my studio, it's got you know seven, eight students in it. And then I'm looking at this you know multi-thousand individual program that I'm leading on the other side. And I was like, you know, maybe it's time for me to start thinking about my own collective impact in the field. And like, what does that mean? What is, maybe I have some unique things that I might bring to the field that are above and beyond my bassoon playing. Uh, and so that was really when I started to pivot out of that work. And I was fortunate to get recognized. I was the uh, one of the top 40 under 40 from the Memphis Business Journal. Um, I was a top professional of the year by Musical America. Um, I got, of course, I mentioned the Sphinx grant. And so, um, and now I'm here at the Community Music Center of Boston, uh, which is one of the largest community music schools in the country. We've got everything from uh, in-school programs with the largest provider of arts education in Boston public schools. Uh, but we also have after school programs. Uh, we have music therapy. So we work with individuals with disabilities, uh, adults and youth. And so we, it's like this, uh, it's this beautiful ecosystem of the type of work that I wanted to be doing. Uh, and so it was really exciting to be doing this work. And now I'm kind of viewing myself, uh, now that I no longer beholden to that, that space of classical music, uh, I'm now considering myself to be what I would like to say is a compassionate disruptor um, of what has been a, a system that, though I was able to succeed in it, it was also an oppressive system for me to be in. Great, thank you. I like that term, passionate disruptor. 
Um, all right, Midori, let's, let's, let's hear from you. Hi, everyone. Uh, I want to echo all the words of thanks and gratitude. I don't think it's a coincidence that we're all from really similar lineages studying with Frank Morelli and Kristen Wolf Jensen. I think that speaks a lot to um, the, the teachers they are because you all know that they're teachers who nurtured these interests that we had. And I think that's not to be taken for granted because there are so many teachers who would have um, that been not as excited as they were. So I think that's really cool that we all share that. Uh, my name is Midori Sampson. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm calling from Madison, Wisconsin. Um, I grew up in Portland, Oregon. I was born to a, a stay-at-home father and a kidney dialysis nurse mother. So you can maybe imagine their surprise when I came home and wanted to play bassoon, which they'd certainly never seen before. Um, but then began this long lineage of teachers who were so supportive and accommodating, starting with Evan Kuhlman. Um, and I went to Juilliard for my undergrad, and I have to say they were very, um, there were so many opportunities for community engagement there. And they were, they really do prioritize that when I didn't see other conservatories and universities doing that. So I got really involved with an organization called Artists Striving to End Poverty, or ASTEP, and I've worked for them for almost a decade now. The first project I did was I went to the Philippines, which is where my family's from, and I taught music for five weeks. Um, and they do, they help connect teaching artists with children all over the world to lead interdisciplinary workshops um, in the way that I got to. And I also, at the same time, co-founded an organization called Tradewinds Ensemble. Um, and we partner with social impact organizations around the world to teach composition. I think composition is such a cool way to affirm children's identities and creative voices, um, to teach playfulness and teamwork. And these are all the things that we try to do um, in collaboration with organizations that are doing a lot of social impact already, but don't necessarily teach music. And we do this instead of applied instrumental teaching, which there are a lot of amazing organizations that do that already. Um, after my master's at UT, I did a two-year fellowship with the Civic Orchestra of Chicago. It's a training program of the Chicago Symphony, but there's a smaller group of fellows, which I was part of, who do many um, extended community engagement projects around the city, um, lots of chamber music, and specifically um, meeting the artistic visions of Yo-Yo Ma, who's a hero of community engagement. So we did a lot of work alongside him um, doing, for example, a project that did songwriting uh, with parents who lost their children to gun violence or um, a school tour where we did this choreographed, memorized, um, interactive chamber version of Don Quixote. Um, and it was during that time when I realized how happy I was doing simultaneously bassoon playing, educating activism and scholarly research. And I was thriving personally in projects where I could be all four of those different things. So that helped me decide to get my DMA, which is what I'm doing now and hopefully finishing in a year um, at UW-Madison studying with Mark Vallone. And I chose UW-Madison for a couple of reasons. First, because it was close to my orchestra job with the Wisconsin Chamber Orchestra, um, which I got when I lived in Chicago. Uh, but I also chose it because I could do this interdisciplinary degree where I'm studying both bassoon performance and social work, social welfare. And um, I, I, having trained at conservatories and universities, my training is very specific and it's in bassoon performance. And so I have a lot of gaps in my education. And while I always knew that I wanted my musicianship to take a social justice stance, I didn't necessarily feel equipped to do that. Um, so I looked to the discipline of social work um, to take a scientific, um, ethical, uh, deliberate approach to social justice in music. Um, and 
I, 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 I use frameworks from social work to inform the way I perform um, and do community engagement. So now my research is about really deliberately putting these two disciplines together to see what kind of impacts we can have. And finally, now I'm the lecturer of bassoon at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. And that's another this like new layer to my musicianship where I'm now teaching college students how they should think of their bassoon playing and the social impact that it can have. Um, for example, like to qualify for an A in lessons with me, they have to reprise any recital they give on campus, off campus at some venue. Um, Thank you. Thank you for the affirmation. <laughs> um, but so that's that's one small thing I'm doing now. And for the last 10 years in small and large ways, community engagement has been at the core of my musicianship. And I wouldn't ever want to try to be a good bassoonist without also trying to be involved in the world, too. Thank you, Midori. That's wonderful. Um, I'd like to hear later a bit more about trade winds and, um, and some of that, but we can come back to that later. Um, so uh, there are a few th themes that came up that I heard um, you kind of uh, touched on how you got into the work and this idea of, you know, we go to school to be a bassoonist and we learn those, those skills. Um, some of you had some opportunities um, through your music programs to start exploring this idea of community engagement, um, but maybe weren't necessarily given the tools. Uh, Kika, you mentioned that, you know, you had an idea, but didn't know how really to implement it <laughs> in terms of like a community survey and, and things like that. Um, so I think we encounter these obstacles like there are a lot of us out there that have the desire to do something but we don't necessarily have the tools um and in some ways kika you also mentioned that like um that you came to teaching later and like kind of came to turn not necessarily came to terms but like you know found that it was an okay thing to do and something that you wanted to do and there are these perceptions out there that if you don't you know um become an orchestral player like you know then then you haven't made it or you know this that you're that you're a failure we tell ourselves that um so um, i'm curious to hear from you about um different ways that you were able to um i guess latch on to uh, the tools that you needed um maybe some just some stories of successes and failures um or how you were able to find help or mentorship in other programs um, what did you look to um, to uh, inform your work? Anyone want to? Me or anybody? Anybody. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, I will just say, um, like, being like, I grew up in southwestern Pennsylvania, 15 miles south of Pittsburgh, and my brother and sister and I were like the only Hondurans for miles around, aside from migrant workers that would come in and work on the farms that are nearby and um i went to an all-white church went to almost entirely white college and i went to a uh, almost entirely white master's program at university of wisconsin where midori now goes to school and i feel like um when you are challenged day in and day out just by the way that you like walk and talk through the world like you start to realize like really early in your life like some things are just like not right and not fair and i feel like um and you know in our current like political and social moment a lot of people um i would say like a lot of people who like maybe before weren't like oh this is like doesn't make any sense are now all of a sudden being like what is going on why are things this way and i feel like i felt this way probably since i was like three or four like i am a Honduran woman. I'm not like a woman first, a Honduran second, or vice versa. Like, I just like, you have to take all of those. I'm an Afro-Latina woman. Like, I, those are never the two divorced parts of my person. And then I'm also a bassoonist, an Afro-Latina immigrant who grew up in southwestern Pennsylvania. All of those things, like, inform every single thing that I do. And so, like, you know, um, so I would just say, like, since I think the first time I went to a protest, I think I was like a, like a junior in college or something. And I went, it was just like me and one other girl. But like, um, 
so I have always like been really tuned in to like the unfairness and injustice in the world just because I, it is like visited upon me and my person a lot. And so um, when it comes to like things, so that's where my, in my interest in like community engagement comes from is like, I, I'm also very fortunate. Like I have a proximity to whiteness. My parents are white. Anytime I got in trouble at school, a white mom comes in to like get me out of trouble. So like, those are things I take into account. And I don't think I would be where I was if it wasn't for those, you know, different aspects of my life and personality. And so my interest has always been there. I have been able, I feel, to get where I've been going because of my proximity to whiteness. And I feel like that is what made me interested in helping other people get where they want to go, uh, despite like the challenges our society makes them go through. And so I took one, one class at the Glenn Gold School about music business, and that's where I learned how to write grants. And so I write a lot of grants. And um, other than that, it's been like a truck, like kind of like, just like figuring things out on my own, like teaching at Duke Ellington was like, was a baptism by fire. Like the school building that we taught in was like, felt like somebody fell through the floor because it was like, just like a like a dumpy building in the middle of DC somewhere and like so it's just like I realized really fast like that kids go to school and they come home from school and they're like man school sucks but then some kids depending on where they live or what they look like or the zip code they were born in go to school where someone will fall through the floor <laughs> and and everyone is like you have to keep going to school there so I think like really it's like a lot of learning it's a lot of like listening, I said this was the last one too, like just like reading, trying to understand people's like lives, like Lacolian is an excellent example. Like um, I met Lacolian in Toronto and then I was like, <laughs> and then I learned all I could learn about Lacolian. I went to Lacolian session at Chamber Music America. Oh my God, like listen to Lacolian, you know? <laughs> He knows what he's talking about. So like, just like doing a lot of learning, listening, people who don't look like you and understand like their priorities. So that was my advice. Like just do a lot of Googling. If you need help figuring out what to Google, you can send me an email, but like, just, do, yeah, just try to like learn as much as you can. I'll, uh, I'll jump in as soon as you're gonna put a, <laughs> y'all on blast like that. I'm like, uh, <laughs> I might as well, I might as well say something in, in response to that. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Thank you. I, again, I, I, I appreciate it. Um, well, I would say for me, it was, um, I, I think that there was a period of time in my life, because I have to go back to the period of time in my life in which I was fully assimilated into this thing, uh, because I, I wish that I had the strength of my own personality to be like Kika. I mean, you know, I'm inspired by someone who walks in their truth. Um, you know, like you, but you're so, you're, you're, you've been doing that forever. Like as long, I mean, I, I met you then uh, and you were already walking your truth in school and I didn't really do that. Um, I, I uh, navigated that system as if being assimilated into whiteness was better. Um, like that was the way to be. And so I had to, my journey was very different. Uh, I would prefer yours. And to be honest, when I think about whatever power I might have right now is to create a scenario in which people can go more like on your journey rather than, than what was mine. Um, but what I would say is that um, I had to, at a certain point, to be honest, it was, it was when I, I had to unplug from the matrix for a minute um, in this whole field. Uh, in order for me to get some perspective on it. Um, the, the first thing, and I may not mention this, I met Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Um, and it, it was the, really a thing that changed my entire life because I used to teach at this festival in South Africa, the Stellenbosch International Chamber of Music Festivals. Great musicians from all over the world were at that, at that festival. I did that for about 10 years. One year, Archbishop Desmond Tutu is there. He is the narrator for one of the pieces that is being performed. Um, and um, at the end of that, we're able to go and shake hands with Archbishop Desmond Tutu. I go to shake his hand. I'm maybe the third or fourth person. And he grabs my hand and pulls me back and he puts his hand up on my shoulder 
and asked me to like kind of kneel down so he can talk to me. And I'm looking at his handlers. I'm like, I'm, there's a line and should I do this? And they're like, nope, he, I guess he does this sometimes. Just let him, we just let him do this one. So I sit there and he says, he says to me, he's like, you know, I've heard about you. And I was like, uh, what? And he said, I've heard about you. And I hope you know that what you're doing here in this country is so important. Uh, because at that time I was one of the few black musicians that were, that were going to that outside of another person named Leon Bosch, who actually was actually a political prisoner. Um, but I was one of the only ones. Uh, he was like, it's so important that you're coming here. Um, and I want you to know that what you're doing, it's changing our country. Um, and when he said that to me, I was just like, this, is our, this isn't like just some person on the street who went to a concert, which that would matter then, but this is Archbishop Desmond Tutu, who is, this was the spiritual leader of South Africa as it transitioned out of apartheid. And so it's like, it would really blew my mind that someone playing bassoon could have that much of an impact. And then I started to realize that I need to learn more about what that means. And so to Kika's point, I had to deconstruct my own assimilation, which required me to go back and really understand the ways in which other people were assimilated as well and didn't know it. Uh, so learning about the real history of America, learning about the history of our art form, um, really getting the competing truth that I played in these beautiful concert halls that my parents wouldn't have been able to see me play in when they were kids. Um, and so like understanding the competing truths of this field um, that it's beautiful music and it changed my life and it took me from where I was from to where I am now, but it also really disrupted who I was as a person. Um, and so again, all of those things together, they required me to just stop trusting what I was given and then learn to go and find, to start asking questions myself and then go and find the answers for myself. So reading books about social justice, reading books about, um, uh, you know, about blackness and blackness in America, reading books about anti-racism, reading books about community engagement and learning that community is a word we use for neighborhoods we never visit, um, right? The community is, that's what we call it. Like if you don't have a restaurant in the, in the neighborhood, you call it community. If you have a restaurant you like to go to there, you call it Cambridge. Right. And so, you know, and so like in getting and, and like starting to learn the lexicon and the language around my own self and my own story and the communities in which I wanted to have relationships. Um, it, it was a, it was actually quite a bit of reading. But if anyone is curious, there are a lot of good books about that. Doug Barwick wrote a good book. Uh, Eric Boots book is very good. And then, of course, reading books by black authors, all of them. Um, I would say that really helped me, especially someone who was working in predominantly black communities. So it's really asking yourself, what are these quote unquote communities that I'm interested in? And what do I know about? Do I know anything about the lives of anyone in these communities? And if I don't, then I'm just a columnist, not a partner. Um, I just want to jump into that too. That was amazing. And I, uh, I'm so happy to be around such inspiring people right now. And it's, it's as someone who got into this work, you know, as a white woman who is approaching this with privilege. I grew up in a very white town. Uh, and I, the first times I really, that made myself step back and look at what was going on with uh, the work that I was doing in schools was when I had moved to New York City and I was seeing these disparities that Kika had talked about, you know, with, you know, a few of my private bassoon students going to this very wealthy school that has many bassoons in this beautiful building. And meanwhile, there's all these other schools that are in different neighborhoods that have much less. And because I'm coming at it from a position of privilege, it wasn't something that I was that much aware of prior to jumping into these schools because it wasn't the experience that I had growing up. And so what Kika was saying and what Lacolian is saying is just, it's so important to just research things, read, look into it, um, and, and then do because, uh, you know, I didn't have the training in going into schools and neighborhoods and doing the kind of work that I'm doing in school. But so I sometimes worry about the implementation of some of that in schools because, um, 
you know, if you take a look at the, the explosion of entrepreneurship classes in, um, in conservatories in a lot of places, it's hard to do it right because a lot of the time it becomes an academic experiment. Um, and it, it's a fine line then when you're doing that with teaching artistry because it really is all about doing and going and, and doing the work and learning about the people and going and making a difference. Can I add something too? Also, I'm also speaking from a place of privilege and having grown up white enough for some spaces. Um, I have an interesting different version of privilege, but um, I want to echo all of this and say that collaboration has to be the starting point. If we don't do engagement in a way that's collaborative with the groups that we're serving or at least trying to serve, it could not only be just not productive, but also offensive and appropriative. And um, I, I don't ever try to set curricular goals without asking what the collaborator wants and needs. And that's why my organization partners with um, social impact organizations that already have such clear missions and they have their needs set, then I can say, let's work together and how can I help you serve those needs? And if it's not um, leading with that, it can be dangerous and problematic. Can I just say one more thing? Uh, did you have another question? I don't want to take away from the question from the chat, if, uh, but I have another comment. Okay. Well, just uh, just one one more, one last thing as it relates to that. And we we who do this work and really value this work, we have to be very mindful of the languages that the things that we use to describe the communities that we partner with. Um, we ha it's really important that we're very mindful of of that. Um, and so when we think about because we tend to use words that describe deficits, um, and the, our partners they don't have deficits. Um, the system has deficits. Our partners don't. Uh, and so when you're partnering with a community, you're not there trying to mitigate some problem of one of my colleagues told me, he said, we have to remember that working with young people, young people are not a problem to be solved for, nor are they so the solution to our problems. Young people are just young people. That's it. So when he thinks about writing about young people, he thinks about, he thinks about a young person that is fully privileged and goes to a private school and how do you write for a young person? How would you write for that young person? You wouldn't say that I'm trying to keep that young person off the streets. You know, it's better that that young person is here than anywhere else. No one says that about a kid at a private boarding school, um, but we say that about, you know, kids in black and brown neighborhoods. And so it's like really trying to reframe how we talk about the, 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 the communities we work in. Do we serve or do we partner? Right? Like, what is it that we do there? Um, and I think that it's really important to, you know, for us to, those of us who have been in the system for a long time, to deconstruct our relationship to the system and our relationships to communities as well. Because we might be, we might have a, you know, colonial white saviorist frame in what we're doing. And however you frame it, that's what's going to be your outcome. Uh, so if you don't frame it as a partnership, if you don't frame it as an equitable relationship, if you don't frame it as I have more to learn from your community than I have to offer, if you don't have a restaurant in the neighborhood where you do your work, if you don't have five restaurants and visit three or four parks, you're a, you're a colonist, right? And so I think it's really important for us to stand in that. And this is not no blame, shame, or guilt on anyone who has programs that do things that way. Uh, this, again, it's a, um, I say a compassionate disruptor describing those things so that people can say, the, so that people can start to think, wow, when I go into whatever communities I go into, what do I know about this community? Do I know anything about this community? So how in the hell am I a value add if I don't know anything about this space? I'm probably not, but I'm still getting the grant money nonetheless, which really that's who most of the time people are talking to when they're doing community engagement work is they're talking to philanthropy. They're not really talking and communing with the communities where they're working. I think that's a great point. Um, you know, there's the term outreach and I, it's a term that I don't really like because <laughs> that's not what we should be doing. We, we should be engaging and collaborating and learning. Um, 
together. Um, so oftentimes community engagement um, is sort of a drive-by thing and um, instead of building a relationship um, with the community that you're trying to serve. Um, so I guess we're kind of run, running out of time already. Um, so I guess I just will fast forward a little bit and um, I want to hear what you think about what we can do right now. So we're in this virtual environment um, and a lot of our programs are um, having to switch gears. Um, where can we find some resources? What are some ideas, maybe some things that you're doing um, to try to address this? And, um, and um, how can we also maybe um, find some, some ideas? <laughs> Anyone? I always have ideas, but I'll step back. <laughs> okay. Nancy, I know you've been doing some uh, some living room concerts, things like that. Um. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So right now, I, you know, one of the biggest things I think about in um, both just general audience engagement and doing, uh, you know, community engaging is um, thinking a lot about the human interaction and the human element of it. And I think that ties in a lot to the whole, like, are you involved in this neighborhood? Do you know these people? Because at the end of the day, it's like you're making connections with people. Um, and so I think a thing to think about now when things are virtual, you know, it's you're still even though you all are little dots on the screen right now, um, it's I'm still talking to people. And and you have <laughs> and, you, and, and you have to think about that as you are trying to organize all of these things um uh you know what and then when you're when you're putting on concerts like why should people care like why are people gonna come in and watch me play in my living room and maybe hear my cat you know meow a little bit like <laughs> because she doesn't like the bassoon but it's it's you know it's um making it relevant and being engaging and being an interesting human being and you know when I speak from the stage, I, I think a lot about, uh, Lacolian had mentioned Eric Booth, one of the biggest things about, he's a teaching artist guru, if any of you guys don't know him, like read his materials. Um, he talked a lot, we worked with him a lot in Ensemble Connect, and um, he often said 80% of what you teach is who you are. And, um, you know, that's a lot about just, it's, it's why our mentors stick with us so long, not just because they taught us the, you know, how to play an F major scale on the bassoon or anything. It's, you know, the way they delivered and the way they nurtured it. And I think, you know, that doesn't just apply to how you are as a teacher, although I really uh, think that's relevant, uh, but it resonates with me as an audience engager and a performer as well. So, um, you know, I think, Making these personal connections, as I said, in the, in this uh, digital time is, is what's going to help us kind of propel forward through the next maybe year, you know, <laughs> if maybe hopefully not more. Great. Anybody else have comments? Lacoli and you can, <laughs> if you have your ideas, you feel free to jump in. Uh, again, it's important, you know, it's it's important for me to understand my own uh, privilege as a man. And so I wanna make sure that I, you know, we talk about people learning how to give up privilege. And so that is why, again, why I step by step back and leave space uh, because sometimes that is what's needed. And so I will model that again by, by stepping back, but I will even have my email address and if people have questions for me, I will, I will gladly share them um, uh, but I will, I will, I will once again, I will step back and leave space for the three brilliant women that are also on this panel. Midori, any, um, kind of final thoughts on the subject? I wish I had an answer to this and I was, I was excited to hear from everyone else. I feel like I've felt honestly a little lost about what to do and, and, um, yeah, I'm definitely not the only person on this call that feels that way. I'd love to hear someone else answer this. In that vein, yeah. I will, yes, with that in mind, I have, I have some thoughts. Uh, I will just share, I'll share some thoughts. And thank you for your humility there, Midori, uh, and honesty. Um, there are some things. I think the first thing is for us to uh, think about this from a human-centered perspective. Um, instead of thinking about what we want to do, um, I think that that is the maybe not the way to enter the conversation. 
Um, we can think about this maybe from what are our assets? What are the things that we're uniquely gifted at doing? And what are the things that our community needs right now? And I would say that uh, one of the things that people read need right now is just hope. Uh, and so what are the ways that inside what we're doing, uh, whatever it is that we do that we can offer, we can just provide hope. Uh, sometimes it's, you know, I see people putting music up. Sometimes it's, these are the young people that I'm still working with. I, people people want to know that the world is still happening. Uh, the world is still going on. So having young people on video, some people are saying that they're sick of that. I'm not, I love seeing it. Every second, that every, I would ask everyone, as, you know, please put people on there, put pictures of, you know, of, of, of young people playing music or just talking about music, do that because I think what people want right now is a little bit of hope. I think in this digital age, we have the opportunity, and I've learned this in my own organization, we actually have an opportunity to become more connected than we've ever been. Uh, and so the idea that we're disconnected right now more than we've ever been, I think is, uh, is kind of a misrepresentation of the opportunity that we have right now. Because we do have an opportunity to really connect. I mean, look at all these folks here. I see Frank Morelli on the line. I haven't talked to Frank since I played with Orphe. It was, I mean, I saw him once since I played with Orphe a couple of years ago. But I like feel connected to Frank because I know he's out there in digital space, like being here on this chat. One of my former students, Cody, Cody Hunter, beautiful bassoon player, he's on the call too. And I feel connected to Cody because he's here. You know, and so we can, we still have an opportunity to connect. But I think, again, this system has taught us that there are specific ways to do things. And if you're not doing them that way, you have to walk in that new way with fear. And I think that we have to learn to walk into that new way with confidence and with joy, because the role that we play right now is providing hope. Uh, I can give bassoon lessons all day, but what, the, my, what a bassoon student probably wants is to connect with another human being through the bassoon, right? Like that's the thing that we offer right now. So I think it might be a good time for us to just reframe what success looks like. Because if success looks like playing a concert, well, that's not what people need right now, maybe. Uh, but maybe what people need is a, a concert of hope. Maybe thinking about what your concert is doing uh, to Midori's conversation about social justice. Are you doing something that is really being open, honest, and candid about what's happening and what has been happening in this country historically? Are you really amplifying the voices of young people right now? I think that's really what people want to see right now. That's what's needed. And I think each of us has an opportunity and a platform to be able to do that. Now, to say tactically what someone should do here or there, that's a little bit harder to do, but I think that people, it's less than a tactical thing and more of a reframing of what success looks like. Uh, because it's, again, if success is us playing another concert and people watching it, I think that that, that frame during this period of time has kind of gone the way of the dodo bird. Yeah, like just to piggyback really quick on that, because Stacy had mentioned, you know, like I'm doing some concerts online right now, like some of the most like fun part of doing that wasn't actually playing bassoon for people it was that we had zoom calls like before and after the concert to like to talk with the audience like they were there and um people that would never have gotten to go and listen to a concert that were on the other side of the country were like tuning into this call and so like what Colleen said it's it's you know reframing your mind to like it's 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 a scary time right now like I don't know the next time I'm gonna play bassoon out in the world um again but uh state of mind means a lot and um reframing to think a little more positively about some of these things is really helpful in finding these opportunities Thank you so much. So we do actually have a, a question from Cody Hunter. <laughs> um, so we'll just end with this, maybe just kind of a quick, like one, um, one thing. He asks, are there any resources you can recommend for someone wanting to learn more about engagement through innovative programming or new organizations within our communities? Um, so if you have a favorite resource, just shout it out and we'll, we'll end with this. Music Teaching Artist Bible, Eric Booth and Teaching Artists International. Uh, that's a good one. Doug Borwick, he wrote a book on community engagement, building communities. Uh, I think it's B-O-R-W-I-C-K. Uh, I think that's his last name. Uh, those, are, those are three that can pop into, they're kind of top of mind. Um, teaching to Transgress, Bell Hooks. Not music specific, but um, philosophy of teaching. 
Uh, I will say I learned by example and the one group uh, organization that is like really like blowing my mind recently is called Challenge the Stats. It's um, based in Atlanta and it's run by this extraordinary musician and harpist named Angelica Harrison who's like very cool. She just won an, uh, like a award from the governor of Georgia or something. Uh, but like I think just look at what she is doing, figure out how you can apply that to your own community, but with a caveat. And like, my advice is, this is what I do in my life. And this is why I'm like, so cool and successful is everything that I want to do to help another person. I say, was it better for me to do this thing? Or is it better for me to go to their neighborhood and pick up garbage for an hour? So like, if the thing I want to do is not going to be more immediately beneficial than picking up garbage in the Bronx, then I shouldn't do it going up and teaching kids who were awesome who look like me like it is important to have teachers that like look like you kind of get it uh I feel like that's a little more important than picking up garbage in the Bronx but like there are some other things I was like well what if I did this and I was like I better just go pick up garbage for an hour so that's my advice like find a metric that you're like I know this would be good but maybe this other thing I can do would be better so that's my advice one other book John Dewey's art as experience before I forget and uh, The Pedagogy of Oppression. If you have not read The Pedagogy of Oppression, it will change your absolute life. Real talk. It'll change your life. I'm serious. Real talk. Because it talks about oppression, the nature of oppression first, and then how pedagogy is oppressive. It's, it's super dope. I recommend it as a life-changing book. Nancy, anything to add? I, everything I had down okay. has already been mentioned, Great. and it's all incredible. All right. And I'll just put a little plug out there. I'm actually working on my dissertation right now um, on this topic and compiling resources. And um, I'll be doing um, uh, a lecture for the IDRS virtual symposium um, in July. So um, hopefully I'll have some kind of, I'll be creating a document and hopefully I can, I can share it with, with folks. Um, so thank you all so much. Um, it's been a pleasure. Um, I'm so inspired. And um, so thank you so much to Go Bassoon and Lee Munoz um, for sponsoring this session. Uh, stay tuned in future weeks. We have a lot of exciting stuff coming up. We'll be catching up with some of our former competition winners um, and finalists. Um, we'll be diving into uh, comp competition repertoire with, uh, with our composers um, that are being featured this year, and as well as um, other special topics. So stay tuned. Thank you so much. <laughs>